The Imperial Russian Army. What about this army formation? In this video, we're going to talk about the Russian Army of the First World War. Stay tuned. Russia at the beginning of the 20th century was an absolute monarchy that was ruled by Tsar Nicholas II. It was an empire that had around 170 million inhabitants. Due to the defeat during the Russo-Japanese War 1904-1905, it was more than clear that the army had to be reformed. And it was also clear that these reforms had to go hand in hand with industrial modernization. Because so far, the country was barely industrialized and mostly was agricultural. The production of small arms was sufficient. However, when it came down to heavy artillery, communication materials and other modern war necessities, the country relied on import. And thus, from the period of 1910 till 1914, reforms were made. These were met by some stiff opposition since the top was immovably conservative. Change happened in the 1910 to 1914 period. The military budget was increased to expand the army. However, the top of the Russian elite was immovably conservative. And thus, these reforms were met by some stiff opposition. Modernization plans of Minister of War Vladimir Sukhomlinov were met with hostility by Grand Duke Nicholas, the uncle of Tsar and commander of the Imperial Guard and the St. Petersburg Military District. By the way, this dude was tall as hell, almost two meters. Anyhow, therefore, reforms went slow. For a possible war on the western frontier, the Russian army decided to build several fortresses in Russian Poland. However, with the development of modern artillery, these fortresses soon became outclassed. And budget was spent on modernizing the fortress guns. Russia was an ally of France since 1890. Three. And Britain was linked to Russia by the Anglo-French Treaty 1904. French loans had to speed up Russian mobilization in case of war by constructing railways in Poland. The Russian Plan 19 for a possible war with Germany was changed from invading East Prussia with four armies to invading it with two armies, leaving two other armies to deal with the Austro-Hungarians. During peacetime, the empire had 12 military districts. St. Petersburg, Vilna, Warsaw, Kiev, Odessa, Moscow, Kazan, the Caucasus, Turkestan, Omsk, Irkutsk and Pri Amur. Russian land forces consisted of the Standing Army and the Imperial Militia. The Standing Army consisted of the regular army and reserves, the Cossacks and the non-Slavic troops. The regular army consisted of infantry, cavalry and artillery. There were also elite units such as the Guard Corps, Storm Battalions and there was also the Russian Women's Battalion of Death. Foreign units also fought in Russia such as the Belgian Expeditionary Corps in Russia and there was also the Russian Expeditionary Force in France. There were also Polish, Latvian and even Serbian and Czech units. When war came, historian Laura Engelstein wrote about how it was perceived by the population. Conscripts may have submitted to the draft with fatalism or repressed resentment, but in an age of media-driven propaganda, submission was not enough. The urban public, even the factory masses, responded to the Tsar's appeal, but sentiment in the villages was harder to interpret. Educated people doubted whether peasants understood the purpose of the war, or were capable of patriotic feeling. Siberian peasants did not have an educated person's perspective on Russia as an empire or the geopolitical laws governing its existence. They did not see beyond the concerns of planting and harvest. But despite all that, the Russians did respond to the call to arms and so did non-Russian minorities such as Baltic people and also Poles responded patriotically, although not all Poles because many of them still favored an independent Poland and fighting for Russia was not something they had in mind. The deputy nevertheless expressed the hope that the United Slavic peoples 
under Russia's lead, would repel the advances of mighty Prussia, as Poland and Lithuania had done at the Battle of Grunwald in 1410. The Jews also harbored resentments. Naftali Fritman, deputy of the Lithuanian province of Kovno, though himself an ardent Zionist, reminded the assembly that the Jews considered themselves citizens and loyal sons of the fatherland despite discrimination against them. Russia was their homeland and they would shoulder arms together with everyone else. The deputy from Kazan province, representing its Muslim population, echoed the general support for the war and expressed loyalty to Russia. Each protestation of loyalty, of course, testified to the danger of betrayal and fragmentation. This month already 1.4 million men were in uniform. In 1915, another 5 million were drafted. In 1916, another 3 million and 730,000 in 1917. When war came to an end, 15,378,000 men had been conscripted, which was almost 40% of the males between 15 and 49 within the Russian Empire. So an army with 15 million conscripts had a wide variety of uniforms and, well, basically impossible to list all the details. Until early 20th century, the clothing was mostly fabricated by the troops themselves with materials provided by the government. But this proved to be highly inefficient. And by 1909, contractors have taken over around 50% of this work. On their hands, the men had a service cap, the farushka, made of khaki colored materials such as wool, linen and cotton. For winter times, there was the papaka, and for extreme cold weather, the bashlik cap. Helmets were not widely distributed. The French gave the Russians Adrian helmets that were worn by the Russian Expeditionary Force in France, as well as elite shock troops. These helmets bore the Tsarist symbol, the double-headed eagle. The field shirt was named the Gymnastyrka. It was khaki brown, but many different shades existed. In colder times, there was the great coat. There was a very, very wide array of shoulder boards. The trousers were tucked into leather boots, the sapogi. As war progressed and leather became scarce, low ankle boots with puttees were distributed. Strips of cloth also functioned as socks. Some soldiers carried rolled up bedding. A brown or black leather belt carried the ammunition pouches, a canteen and a shovel. Furthermore, there was a bread bag. Mass kit and eventually gas masks were introduced, such as the Zelensky gas mask. A standard infantry rifle was the Mosin Nagant M91, a five shot bolt action rifle. The additional bayonet model M1891 was rarely provided with a scabbard, since according to the Russian military doctrine, it always had to be attached on the rifle. Officers carried a Nagant M1895 revolver. There was the PMM-1910 machine gun and even the Fedorov Avtomat, one of the first automatic rifles. It did see limited combat during the First World War and saw more action during the Russian Civil War. And let's not forget the Model 1914 Grenade. Russia mobilized on the 31st of July 1914. The first Russian army crossed the border into Germany on the 15th of August and thus began the Russian invasion of East Prussia. On the 20th of August, Gumbinen was captured. One Russian army was defeated during the Battle of Tannenberg and the other one during the Battle of Missourian Lakes. The Russians were clearly on the losing side here. The Russians were victorious in the Battle of Galicia and captured Lemberg from the Austro-Hungarians. Battles over the Carpathians continued well into 1915. In May that year, a combined German-Austro-Hungarian offensive pushed the Russians out of Galicia. That summer, it culminated into the Russian Great Retreat, where the Russians retreated, giving up Poland to the Germans. It shortened their front line, but it was a severe blow to morale. A year later, in the summer 1916, the Russians launched the Brusilov Offensive. It was a success because the Russians captured a belt of 60 miles of enemy territory. Because of the inefficient Russian transport system, Brusilov wasn't able to follow up his offensive. It also proved to be very costly since the Russians lost 1 million casualties, according to historian John Keegan. 
In February 1917, a revolution took place in Petrograd, modern-day St. Petersburg, which ended the rule of the Russian Tsar to make way for a provisional government. Its new leader, Alexander Kerensky, believed the war against the Central Powers wasn't lost. He therefore launched the Kerensky offensives that summer. The plan was to push towards Lviv. There was some initial success, but soon the Russian army was halted in their tracks. This offensive proved to be the nail to the coffin of the Russian army. More on this later. A big thanks to my patrons you see on screen and a special thanks to Joan, Peter King, Tanya Dixie, Henry Clarkson, Rob Park, RL and Colin Castleman. If you want to know more about the Imperial Russian army in their fight against Japan during the Russo-Japanese war, you can click right here. And if you want to have the full in-depth story of Russia during World War One, you can click right here. Thank you so much for watching. See you later.